Today is Tuesday, August 5th, 2014. My name is Jason Higgins and I'm an intern with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. I am in Oak Mogi at the Public Library to interview recent Medal of Honor recipient Melvin Morris and discuss his experiences during the Vietnam War. This is part of the Spotlighting Oklahoma Oral History Project. Mr. Morris, thank you for joining me today. Okay, thank you. Let's begin with when and where you were born. I was born in Oak Mogi. Yeah, uh, January 7, 1942, and uh, the first school I attended was Uganda Mothers Catholic School, and I uh, transferred to, uh, I think, of Banneke Elementary in 1950 from Uganda Mothers, and uh, continued in high school until '59. At that moment, it's when I joined the uh, Old Muggy National Guard. Interesting. Um, and during that time, did you go to segregated public schools? Uh, during that time, uh, all Old Muggy was segregated. Hmm. And uh, yeah, and we all know that. Uh, but you know, we went to separate churches, separate schools. Uh, uh, certain areas you shouldn't be in, and you know, it, it was a life that we really didn't like, and I'm glad it's not like that now. Um, was there a close-knit community for you and your family growing up? Oh yeah, during that time the family was real tight, you know, and we could always come together, the whole family, and uh, those were good times. Interesting. And do you have brothers and sisters? I have brothers and sisters. I have one sister that is deceased, but I have uh, three brothers and three sisters mm -hmm. that live. Mm -hmm. So a fairly large family. Large family, yes. Tell me a little bit about your parents. What did they do for a living? My father was a carpenter, brick mason, cement man. Uh, he was just a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. I was getting there and <laughs> I've seen him do a lot of stuff. Wow. Yeah, but yeah, he worked hard to take care of the family. Yes, mm -hmm. he did. And did you work going, growing up as a kid? I worked with him quite a bit. I was carrying bags of Portland cement and they outweighed me, I believe. <laughs> yeah, I did the brick work, the concrete rock work, I did the roofing, I did the hardwood floors, I learned lots. I did lots. Did you have any influences in school as far as your education? Favorite teachers? No, I didn't have favorite teachers. Hardly, because back then they used to paddle on you. <laughs> <laughs> See, and I didn't, never care for corporal punishment. I didn't get too many beatings or beatings. But, uh, as a, I think Mr. Wallace was about my favorite teacher. And were you involved in sports or any extracurricular activities? <laughs> I'll tell you what, we, back then only the best got the best equipment. Mm -hmm. And ones that wasn't so good and small got the worst equipment. <laughs> and I run out on a football field one time, I was holding my pants up. <laughs> and I wore seven shoes, my shoes were 13. And my helmet was a large, so can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so tell me a little bit about your path to the Oklahoma National Guard. What made you decide to join the military? Well, you know, uh, at one point we wouldn't allow to join the National Guard. And they, but they did have a couple of people, you know, I'd call them token. And uh, some I put out the word that they were one more uh, African Americans to join the National Guard. Hmm. And I think about six or seven, eight of us decided to join at that time with that opportunity. And so we all went together, we joined the National Guard in 1959 hmm. and went to basic training in the EIT uh, at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and then came back to Oak Mulgee National Guard in 45th. I picked the name of the infantry company, we were infantry. And I made one summer training commitment. And uh, when I got back, I decided to go to the military. 
Absolutely. And coming from a, a deeply segregated southern town or midwestern town, if you will, in Oklahoma, how did you integrate with other troops uh, in, in the National Guard during that time? I didn't really have an opportunity because I uh, wasn't able to, to, to develop no uh, comradeship. Uh, huh. We were just separate, huh. and that's the bad thing about it. Yeah, and uh, so actually I can't even tell you anybody I made friends with during that time. And did you keep up with the eight or nine that you joined up with? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And unfortunately most of the deceased already. Uh -huh. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your decision to go active army and then Green Beret Special Forces. Uh, a lot of people, well it was several things. First thing I did like, we come from a military family, long history. And uh, you know, most kids grow up, they tell you, what do you want to be? I always wanted to be a soldier hmm. and, and a paratrooper. Yeah, one of my favorite uncles was a paratrooper. And I liked the uniforms. <laughs> and uh, that was one of the decisions that caused me going to the military. Hmm. Yeah. At what point did you meet your wife? I went to Airborne School in 1961. And uh, then it was segregated even in North Carolina, everywhere. Hmm. And, you know, we didn't have that many places to go. And so soldiers, you know, they would tell you places to go and not to go. One of the places to go was the USO. Hmm. And that's where I spent most of my time at the USO. And I met this lovely young lady, Mary. And uh, we hooked up and married real quick and been married ever since. <laughs> Um, so tell me a little bit about uh, growing up during the Cold War era. Did, I know that Kennedy established the Green Berets as soon, at, at the same time as he did the Peace Corps. Did uh, Kennedy or politics have any effect on your decision? Well, look back at what Kennedy did establish the Green Berets. No? Oh. No, no, no. Green Berets actually was spin off of the OSS and, and, and Darvish Rangers. Uh, and the Rangers from uh, World War II. Mm. And they were considered special forces. After that, that was the correct name uh, during the, the 50s. See, uh, the Green Marines were actually established in 1952. Okay. And uh, I came here in 1961. Mm. I just attended the uh, 60th anniversary of the uh, 77 Special Forces Group. Mm -hmm. uh, but getting back, we would say, well, you want a first green uh, berets. First green berets, correct. But they had green berets way before that, but they were kept in the footlocker. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah they wanted to wait from the uh, posts uh, on certain missions, and they would put them on where they couldn't get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the beret hadn't been around for a while. Now, President Kennedy and General Yarborough came to a conclusion and made agreement to award the Green Beret to the Special Forces. Uh -huh. It was about a controversy and a lot of argument, but it, the job got done. So John F. Kennedy officially awarded us the Green Beret in October 1961. And that's how, and I was there, and that's why people say one of the first to see the Green Beret, not the first Green Beret. I see, I yeah. see. <laughs> yeah, one of the first to see the Green Beret as being official head year. Hmm. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the training process of the Green Beret. Well, see, in my time, it's different than now. Right. Today is uh, a lot more technical a lot more difficult, a lot more physical. Uh, when I went through, you went through your qualification course. See if you're a man or not. And see if you had your head on right and see if you had enough intelligence. And once you pass a qualification course, you are assigned to a unit. And well, while you're in the unit, yeah, we had what we call the flash uh, on the green beret, mm -hmm. the background. And we only got a little piece of it, not the whole flesh. And what they call a candy bar. 
and that mean that you wasn't qualified as a Green Beret. Right. You were just there, going <laughs> right. through training or you were administrative or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, in order to get the flash, you had to meet all requirements and pass all uh, the requirements. And at that time it took anywhere from a year to two years to meet that standard. And so I got mine, and it took me two years, from 61 to, uh, no forget, September 1963. It's when I was awarded my flash, and that was a proud moment, which I said, you know, military occupational specialty identifier. Mm -hmm. Back then it was called a three okay. on the MOS. Uh, but now they have the same identifier, and Actually, not a green braids for life, really, because no one else has it at MOS. Yeah, but their training is uh, very, very tough. It's similar like to being in the Marine Corps now. Hmm. Uh, they put you through a lot of stress, a lot of uh, physical and mental training. And uh, understand that a dropout rate is very high. Mm -hmm. So. You start with a class of 100, you might graduate 25. It depends. Wow. It depends. But it's not easy. It's not a cakewalk. Right. <laughs> it's, it's not for everybody. And yeah. during that time, were you training in uh, unconventional warfare, guerrilla warfare? Yeah, that, when I was in, emphasis was uh, called Cold War Zone. And my training mostly was uh, for uh, counterinsurgency, guerrilla warfare. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And did you have survival training as well? Every green break is survival training. Yeah, that's when you come in with the sneaky Pete and the snake eater. Right. <laughs> yeah, and so survival training is, is one of the main focuses. Because if you don't count an insurgency, you got to be out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you got to be able to take care of yourself. And yeah, tons of survival training. Mm -hmm. Um, and did that develop camaraderie among the other Green Berets during that time? Green Rays have a different philosophy about things, and I guess that's why it's just a chosen few that we call them the silent few. Uh, our brotherhood is real tight, regardless whether you knew the person or not. Everyone lives by the same code, right? Let's take care of your brother. Yeah. So after you finally uh, was designated a full Green Beret, was there a sense of pride? And did you graduate? Was there a graduation ceremony? They, they don't have, uh, I don't know, know what to do now, but we we didn't have that. Like, it's known on an individual basis. Okay. Mm -hmm. not, not as a group. Because remember, you were working toward that. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds a lot like uh, a lot of the submarine trainers, you know, they have these certain things that they have to do to build up their occupation. Yeah, you got it, yes. yes you Something do. similar. Um, so, can you talk about your first deployment? Sure. Uh, yeah, I uh, volunteered to go to Vietnam. Okay. Were you deployed at any time before Vietnam that you can talk about? Oh yeah, I, I was, uh, SF was uh, nothing to talk about, but I uh, went to back to 82nd in 1965 and was deployed to the Dominican Republic. Yeah, they had a little crisis going on, and I stayed there until August of 1966. Okay. Came back to Fort Bragg, back to the Green Beret, and with the next year and a half, I was back, I was in Vietnam, and that was in 1969. Tell me about your decision to volunteer for Vietnam. Was uh, All Green Berets want to, want to get into the action. You know, uh, that's that's what we do, and that's what we we'll make. For, and and uh, if you don't have nothing behind you, you can be looked at kind of funny. Right? Right, right. So I want to be with the rest. I see. Yeah. How did you prepare yourself to be deployed to Vietnam? Did you talk with your family? Did you have children at that time? No. I mean, just something you gotta do, and when you got a wife, she understands that. And then they live by the thing that they know he can leave at any time, announced or unannounced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some things you can talk about, some you could, some you don't. 
And she knew that. Three children. Was that the time? And yeah, she had three children at that time. <laughs> and you know, the military didn't really take care of their families uh, back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, you normally wipe that to pen on her own. They didn't have the services and stuff to help them out. Yeah, but now you know, they're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I ever remember them saying is make sure you got a checking account and make sure you get your wife a uh, power attorney. <laughs> yeah. And we just say yes so she can say sign up on down the line, don't keep them alive. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you arrive in Vietnam? Was it on plane or ship? On um, commercial flight. Commercial flight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I landed in Saigon, town some new. Tell them about the entire plane would fly over the kids would think it was your okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, but when they're on commercial flight, man. You know, they pick you up and you go the way you gotta go. Mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't go over there, I say, so I wasn't conventional. And so, you know, being green brave, be, to do things on your own. Right. Get from point A to point B. So set orders in this way, you gotta be at this time. Yeah. You leave Fort Bragg to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, you process out, you catch a Mac flight to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your first impressions of Vietnam, the first couple of days in country. Um, what did you think about the, the new environment you were in? It didn't bother me that much. Because you remember, I was in the Dominican Republic for a year and a half. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I just come out of a combat environment that was tropical, mm -hmm. which is about was the same as Vietnam was. It was just the amazing, you know, the different culture mm -hmm. and stuff. But that, that didn't face me that much. Okay. And uh, do you recall your first mission out in Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, I do. Could you take us through your first mission? Yeah, uh, we, after we went through uh, orientation training to familiarize ourselves with the weapons and this and that, and the equipment, you know, this and that. Uh, and we were assigned out the units. And uh, while we were there, somebody come to the idea that they need to form, form a special unit because they had a mountain called Nui Koto that they had been trying to retake and hadn't had no luck. So they formed a unit which they call a special weapons platoon and they want to volunteer from each state. And I volunteered again <laughs> and went through training and I was uh, on a, a gun jeep. If you ever seen the uh, I can't remember the name of the movie now. Rat Patrol. Mm -hmm. you, ever, you ever seen an old movie? I'm familiar with it, yeah. Yeah, well, I was on one of those gun jeeps, uh, 50 caliber and a 160 millimeter house. Okay. Uh, not a house, but <laughs> I'm getting a mm -hmm. recorder's rifle. Mm -hmm. And so we were deployed there. And I remember coming off the helicopter and the fighting was going on. And I got off. And got my position and I started shooting and if I seen somebody move I was shooting and my old team started to slap me upside the head. <laughs> they said, you shooting in the friendly troops, you need to pick your target. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so that was good training for me, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you were, you were trained in counterinsurgency, so you are more prepared than the general infantry soldier and going into Vietnam as oh, far yeah. as distinguishing oh. civilian from Right, non exactly, right, exactly. We did what we call the uh, uh, train a stereo up area study. And you have to go in there and know the people more, the values, their traditions, and what to do, uh, and what uh, not to say or what to say, you know, uh, because it's in serious trouble. So you had to understand who you were dealing with. Right. Yeah, but we always had that dual role. Like we would be called on at times going to conventional mode mm -hmm. to do conventional fighting if need be. Yeah. Um, how long would you be out in the field on average during your missions? <clears throat> Actually, uh, all of Vietnam was a field. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> right, right. All of it was built. Now we were going to operation and say it could last uh, two days, three days, one day, could last a week, depending on the situation. Yeah. And uh, during your time in the first few months, were you fighting uh, Viet Cong or NBA? Depends on what you run into. Mm -hmm. It depends on what you run into. I've had a uh, been fortunate enough to take prisoner wars. Uh, I've stayed I've stayed in a lot of action. I was decorated quite a few times. And um, yeah, see, you could have uh, contact almost on a daily basis if you were really looking for them. Right. Yeah. And. Uh, Sorry to regress a little bit, but this is 1969. This is the height of the Civil War movement. Did you pay attention to a lot of the the issues going on back home at that time with Martin Luther King? I didn't get involved in politics. I didn't get involved in race relations or any of that stuff at that time. Because you got to remember, at what we were doing, I had to stay focused. And uh, sometimes you're not focused. It could, it could be your last time. You're aware of what's going on, but you always say that you, I'm the charge of the commander in chief, president of the United States, and, and you, you honor the rules of armed forces. And so, I, I try to keep a level head. Now, they, I know they had their problems in the states, but I was overseas in a different situation, and I had to handle what I had to handle at that time. Um, so, what were some of the dangers out in the field? Uh, can you talk about punji sticks or booby traps? Well, at one, one event I did hit a booby trap. It was what they call a cluster bomb unit. And it had strung a fishing line across the path. I didn't see it. And at that moment, I said, I'm dead. And come and I heard the pin clean, and it didn't go off. And I said, I must be the luckiest man in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they had it all. They had mines, they had punchy stakes, they had booby traps, they had snipers. Uh, they, had, they even would hang snakes and tongues. So, you know, and so you'll never say. You always have to stay on top of your game. You know, I always stay aware. When you get off your game, something bad's going to happen. How many uh, fellow Green Berets usually went out in these operations? It depends. Yeah, I was in a, uh, if you're in a certain in your specific unit, like I say, you're about the 50, we scouted all over the place trying to take this mile. It, was, it probably was maybe 100, maybe 200 at that time. Wow. But we all worked with individual units. And Green Berets are, uh, form as 12 man operational teams. And sometimes they go to split team concept, which will be six men, unless you're short of people and you do with what you got. And uh, then you're spread off from that, uh, like I was a, a company advisor. So just one, uh, me and one other. Okay. Yeah, even though we'd have, uh, say, 60 or 70 men, it would just be those two Americans. So you were training or working with Arvin or South Vietnamese? No, Cambodians and Mountain, Mountain Yards. Okay. Mm -hmm. We did have some uh, Vietnamese units, not that many. <laughs> How did the Cambodians and Mountain Yards uh, hold their own in a firefight? They were very loyal people, very courageous, and uh, they would fight you to the end. So I never had a problem with them. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Fear of being with them, even if I was by myself. Mm -hmm. No. Can you talk a little bit about the culture uh, that you experienced while you were near Cambodia or in Cambodia? Well, their culture was sort of like American Indians. And they were tight knit, knit group and, and villages and stuff. And then they had their morals and values that you know you had to be aware of. Uh, you didn't talk to the women, you didn't even look at them really. Uh, you could do certain things that they could take you out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you didn't uh, make them lose face. You know, uh, yeah, we just had a drink up there at uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, they make their own 
home brew uh, on uh, alcohol, mm -hmm. and it's made out of a lot of stuff. And they invite you for a drink out, and everybody drinks out the same straw. Mm -hmm. And if you say you don't want to drink, now you'll you lost face with them. And and that's what you don't do. So even if you don't drink, you drink. <laughs> right. yeah. So uh, what qualities make a good Green Beret leader in the field, uh, especially in the advisor? Yeah, that's a hard question. I'm going to answer it one way. You got somebody out there that knows his job and does what he has to do. That's the quality. Huh. Yeah. You, you, you don't give up on nothing. And, and uh, yeah, it, it, it's, that's a hard question because yeah, Green Beret is so unique. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's one I really can't answer. That's what my answer, like my trainer tells me, I like what you answer. People that just do what they have to do. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. And uh, how long were you in Vietnam before you were injured? Before you, you mm -hmm. received your... Uh, nine, nine months. Nine months. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular time during that nine months that you want to talk about a specific incident? No. Uh, I can talk about the incident, but that's nothing else because it becomes commonplace. You, you know you you know your job, right. and you know you're going out every week, and you know you go. There are many many combat actions, but they never you leave one to the next, so you don't try to the boat on the one you just finished. So to me, they're all the same. They're shooting bullets, mm -hmm. and there's no difference. All right. <laughs> So how did you uh, cope with the loss of American soldiers in the field or the Mountain Yards or Cambodians under your command? It, 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 those I bury because you, you, you can't dwell on those events. They're going to happen every day. Right. And you, know, you become a little numb. That's survival. And see, and so, and, and that way, you start worrying about what happened yesterday. Then you start developing fear, mm -hmm. and see, and fear what part of my game. So I didn't dwell on what what happened yesterday. Uh, I didn't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm in it right now. Yeah. I hear a lot of combat veterans talk about superstitions or good luck charms. Did you have anything None. that you carried? No. No. Okay. Um, well, could you take us through the events of September 17, 1969? Yeah, yeah, it was still a routine mission, like I tell you. It was what we did every day. And just this particular uh, day, I don't know what made it special. I can remember the night before that, I could see helicopter gunships prepping the area, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, at night time, you see the tracers coming down. and, and uh, you look at the mountain traces, say something's going on. Sometimes you see them going back up. That's the enemy shooting back. And I said, oh, it's going to be a tough one tomorrow. And so we go out uh, and we dismount and get formed together and go uh, continue on our mission to a certain point where we had to go there. And I think we were looking for a rice cache, I believe. Rice cache is where they store up all the food for the enemy. And uh, went across the rice paddy into the village. Got the village. Well, on the way I was picking up uh, safety pins for mortar rounds or whatever. And that made me take a little moment to think. Mm -hmm. And so I started getting more cautious. And we'll go through the village, and the old lady was out singing. And I didn't like that because there was no activity in the village. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is not good, so this is not good. So I just reformed my company because I felt like something's bad going to happen. And there was three companies. And I had the one farthest to the east, or closest to the river, the Macon River. And so they moved out and they were in front of me, I'm last. And I get a call back. I know, I was so far back, I didn't get a rifle shot or a machine gun part. And my team sergeant was killed. My team captain was wounded. Uh, my tail sergeant had kicked a mine, and he was wounded. 
And so I had a young American with me, Miles, Ben Miles. He was E4, and I was a staff sergeant, so national in charge. And so I had to go ahead and move in to help out. And hearing that my team sergeant was killed, I know my first action was to recover his body. We don't we don't let no enemy take our, our dead. Our dead belongs to us. And if we had to stop everything to, to recover, that's what we would do. So I moved out the unit and I uh, hooked up with him. And first thing I had to do was go in. Well, the first thing I did was, I knew it was bad, but we got a lot of fire going in. So I took every machine gun and the unit lined them up, get all the ammunition, and I just told them to open up, let everything go. And they couldn't hold the fire because the enemy threw it back twice as hard. So I said, a lot of, a lot of fire in there, but I got to go. So I got two volunteers and I went in and I found his body. I gave him last rites, and when I did that, all hell broke loose. The two with me got wounded, and I didn't get hit. I got them out, I had to leave the body, so I got two more volunteers. Come back in, we get his body out, and while we're getting the body out, the map case fell out of his pocket. But we had him. so. I go back here next time with me and my interpreter. And when I get inside, I kind of made here this morning. When I get inside to get the map case, get the map case, an enemy popped up out of somewhere. And standing right in front of my interpreter, he couldn't shoot. And he shot me in the chest. And I was able to take him out, but I went down. And, uh, my interpreter had the map case and he was out of there. <laughs> he was gone. And then I'm by myself. So I back up behind a tree. But see what happened when I went back in with, with the interpreter, I threw hanging aids everywhere. I put them in every bunker. And I don't know how many bunkers. They say, what, six bunkers or something like that. Was more than that and I could see them go down the trenches and I throw hanging aids in the trenches. It, it was a, a lot of activity that day. And see, a lot of it's not recorded because nobody can see everything that goes on. Mm -hmm. You know, but I was one that uh, was hitting the chest the first time. And then the second time, uh, no, I was hitting the hand the first time. Because I threw a hand grenade and they were able to lock in on me. And then the second time was when, when I got hit in the chest. And then the third time I got hit in the uh, right arm, I'm still in there. And I'm by myself now. And so I told myself, I'm going to get out, just fight my way out. And, but I had told my sister, if I go down, you just move out. I don't want nobody else coming to get me. Yeah, do it later if yeah, yeah, I'm still alive. I don't have to impress some more. Or let, that's what it'll be. And I said, no, I'm going to fight. And uh, I was able to get my weapon because I had dropped it. I was able to get my weapon. And I started to uh, unload. And I fired as many rounds as, as magazines I had. And then when that was over with, uh, I asked the Navy. Well, I had talked to the Navy. They said they uh, could throw some explosives from me. They did that. And it gave me a chance to, a little lull in the park, gave me a chance to get out. And I said, run. <laughs> and run. I'm shot three times, but I got to run. And so I run, I don't know how far, I figured a quarter mile, maybe more, to catch up with them. And they were surprised to see me. And immediately they made a, a stretcher put me on a stretcher, you know, call my mother back, and I was out of here. So, in the midst of this firefight, was this instinct training that kicked in, adrenaline? See, all this is mental. Uh, mental. Uh, your adrenaline kicks in automatically when 
things get really get serious. And we had a saying, if you ain't got no drama, you're a dead man. Mm -hmm. uh, drama is your survival instinct. Your training kicks in. You do things that you think you could have never learned, but you did learn. And you know, you could be in class, oh, this is born to me, I don't need it. You better be taking it in, because it's locked in your conscience. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything in my conscience was kicking out. It was kicking out, no control. I mean, you're operating on automatic. And uh, you're doing the right things. And uh, I tell everybody, pay attention. You think you're not getting it, you're getting it. Listen to it, it's there. Right. Yeah. And uh, the training really saved me. Yeah. Knowing that the things to do at the right time, or knowing what you have to do to survive. Mm -hmm. So, how long did it take for you to recover from your wounds? I was in the hospital September, October, November. Uh, I was home December, right? Zing. Zing. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, you know. I was home with this summer. Uh, uh, then I volunteered to go back to Vietnam. So, so you, it took me about four months to recover. So you, you were still healing from your wounds whenever you volunteered? Yeah, I wouldn't even heal, there. really. Wow. Yeah. So uh, what decisions led for you to volunteer to go right back? Yeah, you don't love it, never, great and great only going to finish work. Hmm. My job wasn't finish. At what point did you learn that you were going to receive the second highest medal? Never knew. I, I, I was already headed back to Vietnam. They said, well, you can't go right now. We're going to have a parade and award you uh, the nation's second highest uh, decoration. So I was awarded the decoration in April 1970, and I was back in Vietnam, May, right? Yeah. Uh, April. Right after the parade, really. And did you spend a, a whole another 12 months in yeah. Vietnam? 13. 13 more months, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so during that time, your second deployment, um, how did you uh, maintain communication? back home with your wife? Uh, by letters, or sometimes we had a radio telephone, uh, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. If you got lucky, you get a call there. Because there was always somebody standing by. I think I only made one or two. One. One, yeah. During that time, in your first or second tour, did you develop friendly relations with the civilians? Uh, no. No? I, I didn't develop friendly relations after that first time. Second time I didn't develop current relations with no one. So was there a lack of trust after that moment? Uh, yeah, yeah. All of the above. Uh, I didn't want to make friends with no one because what I was doing was very dangerous. Mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't need nothing bothering my conscience. And, you know, that, that didn't mean I would still take care of you, whoever you were. But I just didn't make develop that close relationship with no one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And was that due to the tragic experience before? Um, did you know the other men well during that event? Well, I knew a lot of them that had been killed. You got to remember that. And uh, you just didn't, I just didn't feel like being close to the one here today and gone tomorrow. Mm. Sounds like a tough existence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I hear a lot that, you know, for those who have never been in combat, it's, it's incomprehensible. Um, how would you, relate your experience to the American public? What should they learn from your experience in Vietnam? Yeah, you know, what I want to let them know that it's, it was, Vietnam was a tough place to be, but you were a combat soldier, uh, not even support role. And uh, that they should give their respect to anybody that goes into combat, uh, Afghans in Iraq or wherever. Uh, especially those who had to really get in there and, and pull their bootstraps up. Uh, it's not a, a movie. It's not an Xbox game. It, it was real. There's a lot of tragedy. And, you know, you see a lot of men uh, lose their lives. They got wives. They got families. Uh, there's a lot of tragedy come out of Vietnam. Really. Um. You know, Robert Moore wrote the famous book called The Green Berets. Uh, are you familiar with that book? Or the movie The Green Berets? 
Oh, John, that's John Wayne. 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 I saw that movie in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> was it? Yeah, I think it was. No, no said, oh, I saw the movie somewhere. I forget. I didn't <laughs> like it. Anyway. Yeah, just because it was a false portrayal. It, it does portray yeah. really as much tougher than that. Right. It is much tougher. Yeah, think of a little shortcoming. What are your thoughts on the media's portrayal, the news media's portrayal of the Vietnam War? The media get angry a lot because they can't just like they they think it should be transparency and you just can't be transparent about stuff. You need to mind their own business. <laughs> <laughs> um, at what point did you become aware of the anti-war demonstrations back home? Were you aware of those while you were in Vietnam? Really, I was. So she was hard to keep up with current events in during that time. And I really, we had enough problems in Vietnam with racial relations in Vietnam. Right. It less more than the United States. It was true because we weren't getting along that well in certain areas. Right. It was still segregated. They had went back to the old days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, fights over music, food, uh, whatever, you know. And it, it, it was, I could see that with the conventional troops. Yeah, but as the Green Beret, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, overt, it was overt, if it was any, but you didn't see it, but out, outside it was over, out in the open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we didn't have time for that. Uh, you could not like me at all, but when we got to doing our job, we did it. We, we you sell things after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had a serious work ethic, yeah. So talk about your homecoming. What was it like reintegrating after your time in Vietnam? No, it wasn't no homecoming. <laughs> Just going back in your family and gave you the homecoming, that's about it. You know, it wasn't any, it wasn't uh, people didn't gather around you or people didn't thank you or people didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. They looked down on you. Oh, yeah. So I've, I've heard, I've read a lot of African-American memoirs of coming home to even hostile African-American communities because, you know, Martin Luther King was against the war, uh, a lot of Malcolm X was against the war. There was a lot of hostility. Did you experience yeah. any of that yeah, personally? Yeah, yeah, most time you, you know, you, you try to keep it a secret that she was in the military. Yeah, you just get out in public and display anything because it's going to come back to haunt you. You know, people wasn't receptive to it. I mean, you know, and people call you different names and stuff. And uh, that was uh, in all races. Mm -hmm. That's how they thought about you. Right. Yeah. Uh, you want right in your head or this or that, you know, a lot of stuff. Did you ever have any issues trying to uh in your relations with friends or other family members outside of your immediate family after your war experience? Did your relationships change? Everything changes after war. Not the same anymore. So you go into that kind of environment and you think things are going to be the same. They're not. They, they have changed forever. And they change you. Uh -huh. You become a different person because you're, you're, you're going through trauma and experiences that you can't even comprehend. And so, and I had a little joke of kind of readjusted. And that's why I have a lot of empathy for Iraq and Afghanistan vets because they're facing something we didn't have to face. That's that landmines, IEDs as they call them. Right. Now you're helpless. You know, they're in the wrong place at the wrong time, and then the injuries come out of them are traumatic. And you have to deal with the new things, traumatic brain injury. And I know that. I mean, I've blown up twice you know, and survived it, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these guys in Afghanistan are really not surviving it. And so you got TBI, you got post traumatic stress, and then you got loss of a limb. Mm -hmm. You see, so it, it, it's, it's terrible. And, uh, it's, People expect them to come back to be sane, to be the same, and they're, they're wrong. They just should give them a uh, pity, not pity, but sympathy. Nobody likes to be pity. Uh, and, and their support. And if they want to talk, let them talk. If they don't want to talk, leave them alone. Yeah. How, how long did it take before you were comfortable talking about your experience? I never have been. 
But you know, for this, I told them today was the first time I really talked up. It's something you don't talk about. Mm -hmm. Do you recall whenever Saigon fell in 75? Uh, well, do you remember anything I, about that? I felt disgust, but I knew it was going to happen. And, I, well, I knew it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. There's nothing I can do about that, you know. Of me on my pay grade, and that's what they had decided that for years already they were phasing out any. Mm -hmm. We knew what was going to go because they were downsizing as the same thing going on in, a, in a, a rack mm -hmm. right now. We downsized, pull out, and the enemy's going back in and try to retake it. Same as that. That's true. Um, have you been to the Vietnam Memorial in Washington? Yes, me a question. Uh, I've only, I've never been to a wall that touched it. I've never been up close. Do you plan to do that at no. all? No. Is there never a been. It's personal. Yeah. I understand. Mm -hmm. um, what plans did you have for life after getting out of the Army? The plans did I have? Yeah. Go to work, feed my family. <laughs> That's it. I didn't have no plans for going to college or big, you know. I just got out and went to work as soon as I can. Get my family back together and you know, do what I have to do to support my family. Yeah. That's it. Absolutely. So, you know, recently in, in March, right, you got the call that you were going to receive the mm -hmm. Congressional Medal of Honor. Had you just completely moved on from your Vietnam experience as much as you possible at that point before receiving that call? Uh, no, I had a difficult time. And I had a lot of difficulty that I went through. And I was on a, really on the road to recovery. And I was afraid, personally, that it's going to throw me back a little bit. But I was able to manage it pretty good. He said, oh, Mark, you got the call. and." Uh, Last year in May. Yeah, I got he it. He said March. It was Good. May. Sorry. May. Yeah, yeah May. May. But, but yeah. It, you know, it didn't. Yeah, you know, it didn't <coughs> throw me back. Uh, none because I had to come to a long process to getting to where I was able to cope with stuff. I have a terrible time with post-traumatic stress myself, mm -hmm. and it's real. Yes, and I tell people you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't touch it, but it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you tried to contact other veterans to, to help other veterans deal with their issues? I, well? I help every veteran I can meet. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it for years, you too. Yes. Yeah. It's very common. I hear uh, from a lot of Vietnam veterans that they want to help. You know, that's a common expression. You know, there was a Mel Honor recipient that reached out to a disabled vet, and uh, the disabled vet killed it. Wow. Did you know that? I didn't know that. No. Yes. One of our Medal of Honor recipients mm -hmm. was killed by another vet. Wow. But he, regardless, you still reach out. You still reach out. So what was it like to talk to the president? I really didn't, wasn't able to have that much of a conversation with him because the president really is off limits. <laughs> right. <laughs> really off limits. He talked me on the phone when he called. He said he apologized for what happened 45 years ago and uh, that he was going to award me the Congressional Medal of Honor, but I was selected to receive it. Up. And uh, that was about the extent of our conversation. And all the conversation I had with him was, he asked me how long you stay, how, how do you stay married that long? And I tell him it's fake makeup. <laughs> and that's it. That's all the conversation I had. So, after 45 years, uh, what was it like to finally receive the Medal of Honor? Yeah, after 45 years, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's something, which I hadn't said, but it's something I wish would have happened 45 years ago. Right. And I'll tell you the reason, me and my current friend told me that, which I always knew. It deprived me of a lot. Even though you don't go out and you can't make yourself get that type of award with the criteria that's set forth. 
But if it would have happened, my kids could have went to West Point or to college. Or our life would have been a little bit better. But it didn't happen. We moved on. We made it. I respect back like that. Uh, uh, it was uh, it's just not to receive it. I I have no register. Not, I'm not not that person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm just glad to receive it. You know, receive it. Do what you got to do now. Make the interview. Mm -hmm. Make the public appearances. Yeah, and uh, uphold the tradition. Now, you came back home during a time whenever the American public wasn't appreciative of, you know, combat veterans, soldiers, anyone who was involved in Vietnam. Do you recall the first time you were thanked for your service? <laughs> a couple of years ago, right? Exactly. <laughs> first time, when they started just going out and saying, yeah, thank you for your service. Other than that, no. Did you ever feel that it was sincere? In the oh, now you do. I can see it. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. But those lost years, I thought, people just didn't really care. Mm -hmm. uh, even on some going looking for work, they, they didn't want to hire you. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and people say, oh, he, he's going to go post, or oh, he's going to do this, he's going to do that. That's a hard time. And the American public goes veterans a lot. Mm -hmm. So they didn't reach out when they should have. And, uh, I don't care what it costs them. They they need to make up. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your home state of Oklahoma. You're the only living recipient of a Medal of Honor who's from Oklahoma. Uh, do you still associate with Oklahoma as being your we, home? We come home often. I'm proud of them. Mm -hmm. I don't put over my down. Nothing should tell you that. I'm a Breezy Creek boy. <laughs> so, yeah. You don't know what that means, see. We live down in the bottom down there off of uh, uh, Third Street, First Street, and Grease Creek used to always overflow. How it got the name Grease Creek is because the Aura family. Mm -hmm. And the Aura family was always dumping this pollution into the creek. And uh, then it, when, that, when it rained, the whole, half, that part of town flooded and flooded bad. Mm -hmm. Just because of our family. And uh, that's how we say Greasy Creek. Everything was greasy. You can see grease everywhere. Everywhere. It was they old, never paid. Old, but it was all. But it looked greasy. They ain't never paid down. <laughs> Polluting this whole town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, were you exposed to Agent Orange during your time? I was supposed to Agent Orange from the day I got to. <laughs> uh, I, I was in the bush here. So you're supposed. Did you uh, have any negative health consequences due to exposure? I really hadn't had a couple exams about it, but I'm hoping not. Because <laughs> normally it's fatal. Yeah. Um, have any of your children followed in your footsteps to the military? They try to don't like it. They yeah. any time they get out of the deal. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you were career military, right? Mm -hmm. How many years? Uh, well, I had a break in service. Okay. But an actual active duty, 23 years. Wow. And a time that was so unpopular, uh, what led you to seek a career? Was it patriotic or economic? It, it was all, all about oh, taking okay. care of my family, got a good life. We had a steady paycheck. I had good hard work. What <laughs> <laughs> was all about? Yeah. It gave us a lot of opportunity to go a lot of places, and my children really enjoyed the military life. They hate to come back to the civilian life. <laughs> <laughs> so, growing up in Oklahoma, it sounds, I mean, you come from a working class environment. Did that contribute to your success in the military? Yeah, because you learn how to work. You have to. It was, you know, being a, you know, like it was back then, you had to work. You got to work somewhere. Like I say, the only job I ever had in Old Muggy was an Old Muggy bowling alley. <laughs> and see, and we had to set pins by hand and see if like the big guys would come in. They'd try to see if they could make the pins ricochet out the pit and knock one of those out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I learned lots and had to work, work well. 
if you had advice for this generation, uh, what would that be for the generation coming up and growing up during this time? Respect your country. Be patriotic. And remember, we fall apart like Russia. Just look at TV. Mm -hmm. Russia was uh, our biggest word because it was a uh, Soviet Union. Now since it's starting to split up, it's become dangerous mm -hmm. and it's falling apart. And the United States will be the same way. People are talking about seceding from the government. Can you imagine if we start doing that, this country's gone. It won't be the United States no more. So I say, look around you, enjoy what you got, enjoy your life, and, and just keep the promise to protect this country. Huh. And that's being, being, being patriotic. Yeah, a lot of people have lost their lives for this. You know, and the young kids, I don't think they have that same, same sense of patriotism. Because they take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. We have to protect these borders. Yeah. Before I ask my final question, uh, is there anything throughout this interview that you wanted to talk about, or even since you got the Medal of Honor that you haven't had a chance to talk about or address that you would like to share? Oh, no, no. Uh, whatever I have stays there. <laughs> yeah, you know. But, you know, I'm a grateful, humble person. I just take what I got and I move on with it. You seem like a very humble person. Yeah. Um, my final question is, whenever history is recorded, what would you like it to remember about your life? To remember about my life, everything. <laughs> I don't have no specials. Mm -mm. I just appreciate every day that I lived and appreciate the day that my feet still on around. Because, you know, I, I could have not been here, you know taking three bullets in the same day and I'm still here, so. Absolutely. Well, Mr. Morris, uh, as somebody who's grown up in a democracy and a civil society, I'd like to thank you for your service to your country and your contribution to the United States, and I'd like to thank you for sharing your story with me today. All right, thank you. Welcome, thank you.